and welcome to the I Rock Knits podcast. I'm Corey Eichelberger, and how do you like that new music? I picked it so that we would have something new going into our third year here. And I like it. I think it's uh, soft and pretty for a gentle start, but then it also has some fun parts with a little bit of instrumental in it. It is called New Day, and it's by Ixon, I-K-S-O-N, which is, I think it has a little bit of a fun, uh, melody. I had a question this week and I really want to get on it right away because I think it is so applicable and in two years I've never talked about it. Where is Victoria, Minnesota? <laughs> so I have people from around the world that watch this podcast and they have no idea where I'm at. So I have a little bit of a, a map here for you. United States, Canada, Mexico. There I am. That little blue dot. And so I am in the northern part of the United States, and here you are close up. So in Minnesota, Minneapolis is right there on your right side. So in the northern half of the, and just to the uh, west of the Great Lakes. So part of Minnesota touches Lake Superior. Um, we have Superior, Minnesota, or Superior, Wisconsin, Duluth, Minnesota right at that juncture. And then the Mississippi River runs down. So the Minnesota River runs into the Mississippi River and that is the border between Minnesota and Wisconsin on the one side. And then on the other side would be the border of South Dakota, which is where I grew up. And then directly below us would be Iowa where my daughter went to school. So we kind of are a Midwest state that is tall and has a little peak out at the top like this. It's very tall and narrow and Minnesota is almost as tall as South Dakota and North Dakota put together. That makes sense. So they're a little bit bigger than we are side by side. So for those of you that had really no idea, hopefully I'll do a really good job of putting these up on the screen so that you can see exactly where I'm at um, in relation to, but not really far from the exact center of North America, really. wearing my Atta Girl today and uh, I put yellow buttons on it but it really is dark green on lime green. Uh, it really doesn't have that much yellow in it so I put a lime green t-shirt under it today instead of my usual yellow dress or my dark green dress. I'm trying to still hang on to a tiny bit of summer here in Minnesota. Uh, I have two audiobooks to tell you about this week. The first one was The Forgotten Garden by Kate Morton that I could hardly wait to finish last week. Um, uh, it was a very long book and it really is about, um, you know, family uh, living along the coast and, and the trauma that happened with um, the sisters and, um, and then someone going back and finding out all these things about her grandmother and what had happened to her growing up and who these people were and oh I, I really enjoyed it. Um, it it was just a wonderful story I really did like it and then I started This Tender Land by Kent Kruger who is a Minnesota author and we are starting back to book club in September and that's our September book we read um, Ordinary Grace I think that's what's called um, by him a few years back and so now we picked um, this one we started it in the car on the way back from our vacation um, up north which I have to tell you about uh, my husband and I decided to go away for a week before I have my thumb surgery before my book goes live before he goes into his busiest time of year which is October um, 
and we went up and stayed in a cabin on the North Shore, so way up along Lake Superior, and then you head north, and we're, we were about 30 miles from Canada, roughly. So we were up there for a week. We were supposed to go on to sun, from Sunday until Saturday. But in the previous two weeks, my husband has had a couple of car breakdowns. So he restores old cars, and he has a Corvette and a Trans Am that he is currently, you know, driving because they're all fixed up well. Had a little struggle. And he's had to have, have a flatbed trailer tow him home on three separate occasions before he figured out actually what was going wrong. So he sent the transmission away to be fixed and then we left on vacation. But I could tell it was really bothering him that the only car we had available to us, even though we are a multi-car, multi-boat family, <laughs> was mine in the moment. And so all week he was, he was kind of stewing on how bad was the damage? Will they be able to fix it? It's an old, you know, they're old vehicles, so um, harder to get people to work on them. And so he finally said to me, midweek, I would really like to go home on Friday. If we could pick up the transmission by five o'clock on Friday, then I could work on the weekend and get that into the Corvette. And then at least I would feel like I have a car to drive. Now, he doesn't need a car to drive because he's not going to work. And um, we can share a car, mostly I'm at home, but it was, I knew it was really bothering me. Kind of like being away without your knitting, right? Like you, you forgot it, you're somewhere and you're just like, oh, if I could just get my knitting back, everything would be better. So I said, okay, you know, we'll go home a day early, that's fine. Well then, as many of you know, while we were away, um, another uh, police shooting occurred in Wisconsin and it was horrific and we had heard about it briefly um, via some updates on our phone but hadn't been here to really see it and then my husband got a call um, on Wednesday night that some of the looting had occurred in downtown near his office building and they're on the ninth and 10th floor but a lot of businesses around there were being vandalized and trashed and his people were trying to get a hold of him and we were kind of out of cell phone range and kind of in cell phone range sometimes and he was feeling pressure to tell people no one should go into work tomorrow there there are just a few people that go in to kind of maintain things that are happening there most of the people working from home but he turned to me and said i think we should go home in the morning or we woke up thursday morning and i knew what was coming and i said you know Okay, and he kind of dangled this carrot, you know, we could stop at a couple places on the way home, but if we could get home today, you know, we could do some sightseeing. We've never ever walked out to Split Rock uh, Lighthouse, which is right on the shore. We go by it every single time we go north. We've never stopped and I had wanted to stop. And, and so I said, okay, you know, but then we started packing up later than we should have and we... Okay, dog interruption, but uh, so we got a late start. And then we were getting down the road and then he said, I, I don't know that we should stop. And we were gonna stop at Betty's Pies for anybody who knows about going up the North Shore. It's just a iconic, tiny little diner that now they've you know, made a bigger space for, but we hadn't been there in years and we had stopped there last year. And so we were gonna eat breakfast there on Friday morning and now it's Thursday afternoon and we had packed sandwiches for in the car. And so we just drove, drove straight home. We got home on, Thursday night and then I pouted. <laughs> I just was mad, I was just frustrated. We had such a lovely time and it is always very hard for my husband to be away and stay away. He is kind of a doer and kind of busy and he did his two big portage day trips. We went to town one day, we had relaxed enough. That's kind of how I felt and so then I was kind of frustrated with them because we got home and he just wanted to dive right back into work and I just wanted to have my two days back, my two days of sitting in the, you know, in the cabin knitting and I'm doing, working on a new design and he knew that and so I have, I was just knitting away and I was really struggling with the numbers and trying to get them worked out and trying to do it in the car on the way home. I kind of threw my knitting down on the floor. I was just mad. It was not the way a grown woman should act. But it is what it is. I was frustrated and now I have my head around the fact that I worked 
Friday for 12 hours on the ebook and Saturday last night I went to bed at 1:15. I'm just pounding in the time to get two designs off the needles, an ebook, an eight book, eight pattern ebook done. Uh, in additional, uh, I also have a new cowl pattern coming out here in the next few weeks. And juggling all this with uh, everything, I, I just went right back into full on on the computer mode. My husband comes in from the garage every couple of hours and says, you're still on the computer. And I say, you're still in the garage, <laughs> which is why I was mad <laughs> that we didn't come home. So anyway, it's fine. We're home. We're working. I'm breaking back in here because I forgot to finish talking about the book <laughs> as I went into the vacation story. So This Tender Land is a Minnesota author writing about um, a sad story. Um, it's located on the banks of the Gilead River in Minnesota. Lincoln School is home to hundreds of Native American boys and girls who have been separated from their families. The only two white boys in the school are orphan brothers Odie and Albert, who, under the watchful eyes of the cruel superintendent, Mrs. Brickman, are often in trouble for misdeeds. The two boys' best friend is Mose, a mute Native American who is also the strongest kid in school and they finally find another ally in Cora Frost, a widowed teacher who is raising her little girl, Emmy, by herself. When tragedy strikes down Mrs. Frost, it's the catalyst for a series of events that will send Odie, Albert, and Mose to rescue Emmy and flee down the river in a canoe. The first, however much I've listened to so far, anyway, the first couple of hours are hard to listen to for me. I have an empathetic um, response to you know kids who are struggling kids who are being hurt or it's not well it's abusive it, it I'm sure it's exactly the way it happened um where when we took children away from Native American families <laughs> put them in schools to teach them how to be white um but uh, I definitely know that it will probably become a much better reading experience once we get through that. So we started and then it was just hard for me to listen to the beginning parts of it. Um, William Kent Kruger usually does an excellent job of writing stories. So I would highly recommend him. This one just, I'm um, on chapter 11, so I'm not that far in. It just made, it makes me sad that we treated people that way. But I wanted to break in and, and tell you that, um, what the story was about, and then also to share the fact that some of you saw on on our way up north in the car, I looked down and the diamond, uh, center diamond on my wedding ring was gone. And it just, I, I just couldn't believe it. I snagged my shirt in the car and it happened in a moment where we were both looking at me and then I pulled it and I was like, oh, I snagged my shirt and then we moved along. But the reason that I snagged my shirt is because the diamond was no longer there and then the little prongs were there. And so it must have been an hour or two later when I realized that it was gone. So we are looking at home and many, many, many people wrote me of finding a diamond after the fact, but we had packed up and gone up, you know, we were on our way up north and I could have banged it at any given time over the last several days. I feel like I would have noticed, but I'm, I don't have great hopes. And that was the diamond that my husband bought me when we got engaged. He didn't have a lot of money. I didn't have a lot of, I didn't have any money. Let's be honest. I had no money. I was in debt. <laughs> I was a poor teacher living in a small town, making no money, $15,000 a year, my first year. And we got paid monthly and I, I just had no money. So his uncle, who was a jeweler in small town in Minnesota, sold him this diamond ring and it was more than he could afford and his uncle gave him a deal. So it has a special meaning for me. We had had it reset, I don't know, and maybe after our 15 year anniversary or something, but the diamond was still that original diamond. So it will be covered under insurance. Things are replaceable. It's just the memories, right? But it was kind of a bummer way to start our vacation. So now I'll chop back into where I left off on the other story. I have my surgery on Wednesday. 
And so we, I have a new plan here. I'm going to upload this podcast uh, uh, Tuesday as usual, and this is going to be just your typical uh, shawl and sweater podcast. I have a tip or trick. I also have some podcasts to, to shout out. Um, I have recipes for you. And then I'm going to turn right back around and record another podcast immediately, which will be a similarly um, formatted podcast, but the entire uh, center section will all be on all the designs for the ebook. Um, I made the difficult decision before we left to go up north that I wasn't quite ready and I had a lot of stress and anxiety and someone very wise who lives in my house with me said, is there any reason that you couldn't just put the ebook out after your surgery? Does it have to go up the day before your surgery? And I was also speaking with another uh, friend, a designer, about some marketing stuff who's very kind to me and sharing some information and knowledge that she has. And I could tell that she was like, wow, you're going to try to put your ebook up and then you're going to have hand surgery the next day. She didn't say anything, but these two things, two people, adult people in my life could tell that I was stressed out. And I thought, why I gave myself this arbitrary deadline to work toward that I would get this ebook done. But really, putting up eight patterns in an ebook with discounts and advertising and marketing that you need to do is not going to be well coordinated on pain medication. <laughs> right? You, I'm already a little woo over the top um, anyway. And so I just said, you're right. Ever, you're all right. I called my daughter, I called Amber, and I said, I think that maybe it should just go out on Labor Day weekend. What is the harm in giving myself a couple days at home, get my hand done, kind of get myself settled, and then just put the ebook up? And so, although this was supposed to be the big episode that I included all the stuff from the ebook, I just decided it really does make a lot more sense to just do it in a few days. <laughs> few days later. Doesn't have to be a hard, fast deadline when it's your own deadline that you've set for yourself. So um, I had a cardiologist appointment on Friday that was in a virtual visit anyway, but I had planned to do it up at the lake. And ironically, a year ago, and I'm, I don't know if I mentioned this or not, but I have a really high heart rate, exceedingly high. So um, I've been monitored for years. It's been this way probably my whole life. I do not have like high blood pressure or low blood pressure to go with it, but I do wear a watch that gives me heart rate um, indications. And I will sometimes occasionally be sitting at rest and my watch will go off and say that my heart rate has exceeded 120 beats per minute, <laughs> which is why I think I have the personality I do. Like I'm always a little excited about things, a little geared up, a little, you know, ready to, to go and I talk fast and I think that's just part of what I feel. And so cardiologist says, Last year we did a lot of tests. I'd been five years and we did the whole, you know, wore the thing, did the echocardiogram. And she said, you know, it's, it's never going to go down, Corey. I take medication for it, but it's never going to go down. Your average beats per minute, which is in a 24-hour period over the time that I wore the thing, and includes sleep, is 97. <laughs> so, of course, I a lot of times feel pretty agitated and but also feel like I have more energy and then I will crash and burn and sleep really hard, right? So anyway, all these things were coming together and I was like, why am I doing this to myself? I think it's because I have excitement about the fact that I wrote, you know, eight patterns and 10 stories, but so this is how it's going to go. All that to say, regular podcast on Tuesday and then a second podcast coming up either the 4th, 5th, or 6th of September. Barring any, you know, thing going wrong with my surgery or me not feeling good after my surgery or something, which shouldn't be a problem, but um, I will put up the secondary podcast for all of you to watch. If you have not signed up on my website for my newsletter, you need to do that. It's going to save you a lot of money. <laughs> So I, I don't send out emails. I don't have a, a blog where I give you updates all the time, but I usually will say when I have a pattern come out and I give a discount. And so when the blog 
post email blast goes live the podcast will be up and you will have a certain period of time to save a bunch of money okay tell your friends <laughs> um that's how i've decided to run it i'm going to try to amp it up in the first few hours um and day of the patterns going live i really need this to go well it has been a huge financial commitment for me and so um, I just need to sell some books and recoup some of that money that I've spent on yarn and sample knitters and a tech editor and a graphic designer and a layout person and all of that and a free photographer. God bless her. <laughs> but anyway, the ebook may eventually come out as a print copy. Now, you certainly could take your file in and print it out. I would like to print some copies. I could not do that ahead of time because I don't know how many pages were going to be in the book because all the pages weren't laid out. If that should happen and you want the hardcover book, hardcover, softcover, in addition to that ebook, then I would go ahead and just charge you the difference in the two prices and then it would, the ebooks would come out. That's how I'm doing it for right now. I, I just need to get it out and be done with it because I've made some other commitments for the fall. And so I'm hoping that at some point after the surgery, everything is happening either pre-surgery or after surgery, um, that I'll be able to decide, get a financial count on that, maybe do pre-orders, but you could be looking for, for that information too if you follow me on Facebook or Instagram um, or if I put it up on the next podcast. How do you know when a recipe is a very special recipe from someone else's kitchen? You've never made it, but you just happen to be in their kitchen. The recipe looks like a hot mess <laughs> because it's used all the time. I even have this in the sleeve and I just took it out and it felt sticky on one edge and I thought, yep, that's probably some um, stickiness. <laughs> so my favorite salad recipe of all, of all time my husband and daughter both say, oh, it's a special meal when mom makes this recipe. It is for a salad, mandarin almond. You take three tablespoons of sugar and put it in a little saucepan and then you caramelize it, heat it up, melt it just a tiny bit right before it goes past to burn. And you put in a half a cup of slivered almonds and you stir that up and and it makes kind of a mess on your fork and, and then you, I put it in a ceramic bowl. I pour it out into a ceramic bowl, set the bowl in the freezer or the refrigerator to cool down quickly. And then I'll take what's in there, which is usually kind of a hard clump of sugared almonds in and put them into a baggie and then just bang the baggie with a mallet or rolling pin to kind of break it up. And so basically make sugared almonds. Then you take um, a bunch of red leaf lettuce and, and tear it. I really prefer the red leaf lettuce for this salad. Uh, a can of mandarin oranges, drained, and a small red onion. And you cut up or tear all your lettuce, uh, pour your mandarin oranges over the top, put the red onion in the salad, or set it off to the side in a bowl if you think that people will not want the red onion on it like my husband. And then you make the dressing. A tablespoon of sugar, quarter cup of vegetable oil, two tablespoons of vinegar, uh, some fresh parsley or parsley flakes, uh, salt, pepper, and then a little bit of hot pepper sauce, kind of a Tabasco sauce, hot red pepper sauce. I just shake a few drops in there and stir that up. I will sometimes put that into a plastic container and shake it and shake it and just pour it on before you serve it. But this salad is best done not pouring the dressing on as an individual, but as to making the salad for everybody. So we pour it over the top of the big bowl, and then I mix it with my hands, all the dressing over all of the mandarin oranges, the sugared almonds, the um, lettuce, and then I just handful it into our, our bowls. 
I think it eats better that way. I, I like it better. Every, every bit of the sauce is kind of distributed. You don't get some lettuce without. Um, I'm going to show you a quick picture here. I've been making it for years and I often serve it to company. So it's like four ingredients. You make your sugared almonds. If you can find sugared almonds somewhere, I buy the little um, bag of slivered and make my own but if you can find them you could certainly buy them don't eat it without them because it's not as good <laughs> if you don't have it with the, with the, that and then the meal that I will often serve if we're gonna have company but kind of homegrown company or not fancy company or family company is baked spaghetti so um, there used to be a uh, restaurant in the Mall of America called Tucci Banuch I don't know if those are nationwide or not. Someone let me know if they've heard of it, but it was basically Italian and they had baked spaghetti and then you choose your sauce for the top. And it's basically just a block of noodles together that they've cut out kind of like a lasagna pan, you know, cheese and noodles, but then you pick a meat sauce, alfredo sauce, red sauce, um, cream, you know, whatever. So I make that uh, baked spaghetti in a pan and then cut the, the squares out and then I offer several sauces. So I will make a sun-dried tomato sauce, I'll make an alfredo sauce, I'll make a red meat sauce or a red plain sauce, whatever you know you prefer. And some people really like red on one side and white on the other and kind of mixing it. Uh, but this is what is contained in this. I got the recipe from Tucci, the Tucci Banuch um, place online. Um, but it has um, spaghetti noodles and then a container of whatever kind of cheese you prefer to make, uh, ricotta or um, I, some people use cottage cheese, whatever. Uh, and then uh, mozzarella, two cups of mozzarella cheese, and then two eggs, um, two tablespoons of parsley flakes, two tablespoons of onion flakes. It has some cinnamon and nutmeg in it um, just for a little bit of flavor. But it's basically a white block <laughs> when you when you cut it out and put it on someone's plate. It, it's not super appetizing looking, but it, it's the lasagna part of, you know, just the block part, and then you pour your sauces over. So the baked spaghetti with the mandarin almond salad to die for. That's your recipe of the week this week. Okay, I have a bunch of podcasts. When I was up at the lake, I listened. People have sent me some. I have so many to shout out, but I'm going to split them out over several podcasts just so that you can um, kind of write them down. Remember, I always make the list um, of all of these things. Like the recipes are all in the Ravelry group show notes. The um, audiobooks are always there. Um, I have a separate thread for all the audiobooks from every podcast I ever did separate thread for all of the um, recipes. I have updated the podcast thread, which was originally podcast Corey watches, kind of a list, and now I have added in podcasts that I've been shouting out. Because not everybody loves every podcast, right? So sometimes you just have to try them out for yourself and listen for the few, first few minutes and see that if it appeals to you. So. I updated the podcast thread. Flock Around the Table is a new to me podcast. It is from Indiana, three women, Sue, Micah, and Deb. I listened to episode six, which was titled Feels Like an Orgasm. And they have a, um, a language, um, what would you call it, alert? <laughs> They're a little naughty. They can be a little naughty. If that, you know, they're funny. They're not, it's not, they're not trying to be, you know, vulgar or disrespectful. They're just having a good time, these three friends. So if, they, if you, that sounds like something would interest you, flock around the table. Drowning in Yarn is a new podcast. I think it's three weeks old, so really new. That's Caleb in Chicago who is drowning in yarn. <laughs> and he had been talking about doing a podcast for a while and then finally decided to do it. And then I think he's the one that goes on the walk to the yarn store. Yeah, goes and they walk, yeah. So you might wanna take a look at that one. 
And another Chicago podcaster who started recently is Heather, the fourth star, and she's on episode six. So we have a couple of Chicago people who've probably been, along with everyone else, home during quarantine, and were, was think, were, you know, they were thinking, hey, I've always said I was going to start a podcast, now is the time to do it. So that's kind of fun, and I like getting in on, you know, the new ones. Uh, it, I think it's fun to always watch that first episode that everyone does when they're nervous and um, trying to get things organized for themselves. Then, oh, this person is from New Zealand, so gotta love the accent. This is Jeff's, and it is called F Fox's Blog Knits. I hope I wrote that right. I often make a mistake on these, you guys, you know that, right? I copy them down in um, crappy, fast handwriting, and then I try to decipher that handwriting later. But this is episode six. Oh no, what? I'm not sure what episode I watched of Justice. Probably the first one. Just in Northland, New Zealand. And then I have been watching in the past and then didn't watch for a while. I think I just kind of lost, lost it. Um, is Queen City Yarn, which is Dying to Knit with Kristen. And Kristen is a knitwear designer and yarn dyer out of North Carolina. And she's on episode 32. So if you haven't watched Queen City Yarn, they dye beautiful yarns. I had a design um, that I did up in their yarn, my Bada Bing uh, shawl, pontini, poncho, capelet, all the things in that Bada Bing. And uh, so it's called Dying to Knit. So dying like you dye yarn, D-Y-E. So there, one, two, three, four, five new podcasts that I watch. I think I had a total of nine on my little scraps of paper that I was go going through from being up north. I'm just lucky I keep track of <laughs> the little slips of paper. I do have a folder now that's orange that says podcast notes on it. <laughs> so if I see something, I can say, you know, Put it in the folder. At least you'll maybe remember that you were going to talk about it. Okay, a couple of tips and tricks this week. I have been noticing recently, or maybe I've noticed before, that people will often post something on Instagram and it will have a mistake in it. They'll spell something wrong, they'll forget you know, to say whatever. And then down below in the comments, they will tell you what they meant to say or they'll, you know, fix it or they'll say, you know, sorry, whatever. But you can fix your post without having to do that. So, and it's super simple. And I just think people don't know enough to look. So and because I've done it a number of times, I thought I would share that. So if you're looking at my most recent, um, post on Instagram, which is from my vacation, the picture from my vacation, and I took some video for you guys. Up in the right-hand corner are three dots, and I may have talked about this before, but I just noticed it recently again, and I thought, I don't think people know. So if you touch on those three dots, a list comes up, and one of them is edit. So you can just go in and edit. Click edit, go in, make your change, cancel it, save it, you're done. Easy peasy. Also, if you make a comment on someone's post on Instagram and you type it wrong or you hit send before you meant to, you do not have to then also go in a comment below that and say, sorry, hit send too soon or didn't do it right. You can just swipe right on your comment and delete it and start over. So super, super easy to do. Anyway, just swipe on your comment right, red, big red box with the trash can comes up and type it over. So two ways to make yourself seem like you're more together than you actually were in the real life moment. <laughs> Ask me how I know. <laughs> I need to thank you all so much for your kind comments your loving words that you sent to me and my mom after last week's, last two weeks podcast. It has been amazing. Not nearly as many people have watched that podcast as previous podcasts. And I think it's because I put It's My Mom Marge in the, the title and people are like, oh, I don't wanna watch her talk to her mom. 
But those of you who did watch found out that it was actually just a regular podcast with mom as a speak, you know, kind of a guest speaker at the end. And you just made her day. Like she, the comments have been overwhelmingly positive and kind and loving. And the fact that she has really had a hard time. Many of you reached out and said, you know, you're missing your children, you're missing your grandchildren, and you haven't been able to see them. I just, I can't thank you enough for kind of encircling her in our little family that we have over here because I just talked to her again the other night and one of you reached out and asked me if you could send her a card and you sent more than that and she was super super tickled yesterday she could not believe she got a package in the mail she didn't know who it was from she opened it up there was the nicest card with the nicest note so you know who you are and thank you so much for doing that. I had no idea when she sent me a text message and a picture and said, look what I got. I was like, where'd you get that from? Because I had no idea that she was actually getting a gift. It, that, that was just, she she was tickled. She says, I'm gonna write them back. And yeah, it, it was just really nice of all of you to say such <laughs> kind things. I love her <laughs> with my whole heart. and. And I know she loves me too, but it has been hard. It's This has been really hard on her and the staying home. And she's very social, like her daughter. Let's do the shawl of the week. This week, the shawl of the week is the Poncini. And I did talk about that uh, on last podcast with my mom. Um, she got one too, and I love this Poncini. It is well written. You can wear it multitude ways. It is fun to wear. It's easy to knit. I did originally knit it with the B Sweet yarn, and that yarn comes out of Africa. Um, it's a woman's cooperative where they're helping women um, in kind of a sustainable way to earn an income and you held your yarn double. And some of you have heard me talk about that before. <laughs> At, you know, holding your yarn double doubles the price. So the reason that people are designing things, holding mohair with things, or holding two strands together, is because then the yarn, people sell more yarn, right? That is part of the reason. So this is lovely yarn though. I, I would do this again in a heartbeat. This little baby mohair, so it's a very, it's got a really nice halo. And then you're making these boxes with yarn overs and stockinette in between them. And then a yarn over row. And then as you will see, it's much longer on one side. So you basically knit a rectangle and then you fold it so that you have like a head hole. And you, Stephen um, B is the designer and he has done a ton of different types of poncinis. So you can do a color block poncini, a worsted weight, a bulky weight. This one's called the eyelet poncini. Uh, there are, uh, I think, nine or 10 different iterations of this design that you can, you can do. It can be worn it, like a cowl, um, you can wear the long tail on your right or on your left. It is um, hooked together. I highly recommend this. It, it was it was really fun to knit and, and easy to do. So I put a white t-shirt on underneath it today. That's not usually what I would wear. Um, but I wanted you to be able to see the kind of the whole. There, you can see kind of how that works. Oh, so it's flat across the front and the back, but then it has this kind of tail here. Lovely. Here's my mom wearing hers. She sent me that picture. And she wore black under hers, but yeah, it's a fun one. I would definitely recommend it. It is available on Ravelry. I, I assume you could get it also through Stephen B by just calling the shop. Uh, it uses Bee Sweet Extra Fine Mohair and Bee Sweet Bamboo. Very soft, very drapey. Uh, it is considered um, lace or fingering weight um, yarns, but then it's knit up at 18 stitches to four inches on a six and an eight needle. So even though the yarns are both fine, you, it does work up quite quickly. 
350 people have made it, uh, and, and he has small, medium, large for sizes, and many other iterations. So if you go out on Ravelry, you can see all the other ways that he has designed this and made it. Mine hangs much longer than that. Mine's a little stretched out, probably could use a wash and a little juice in the dryer, but um, I'm afraid about that mohair getting a little felted. My mom's, I felt like my mom's was a little felted even after I just blocked it. So gotta be careful, a little careful with that kind of stuff, especially if it's something you like to wear all the time. And the sweater of the week this week is what I call the Monos Wrap Front Sweater because I knit it in Monos. But originally it's just called the Neck Down Wrap Cardigan and it is a knitting pure and simple pattern. It was designed in 2007 and it is a staple. It is a wonderful sweater, just classic design. Mine is wild and crazy, a little over the top but it's just a phenomenal sweater. So if you have a dancer, ballerina, ice skater in your family, this is one of those traditional kind of wrap front sweaters that they would wear prior to, you know, during their warm ups or whatever. Um, 500 people have knit this. It's uh, knit out of size seven or eight needle. It's worsted weight, 18 stitches to four inches. I did do mine in a single ply yarn, which meant that it was gonna pill like the Dickens. But because it is an entire blank slate of stockinette stitch, it holds up to those variegated marled um, yarns that you sometimes don't know what to knit with them. If you have a sweaters quantity in your stash that's got some high variegation in it or even very tonal, this, you know, this works really well. It was a fun knit because of the construction. So I'm gonna try to show you how this works here. How this has a little cross right here. Yeah, and then it's tied. Well, this tie comes all the way around and is knit onto this piece. And in the pattern, she literally has included a yarn over hole at the waist on that other side for that tie to come through. So there is quite a bit of extra knitting than a traditional sweater because you have this whole extra flap that tucks in there, but it makes it such a nice fitting sweater. If you have a nice waistline, this belted little I cord that comes across the back here really accentuates that. That's really nice, but you can also tie it super loosely so it doesn't pull in at all if you don't have a waistline that goes in in the back or the front, you know, like some of us. And it is long sleeved. Mine uh, got felted a little. We won't talk about the great felting debacle of 2012. Husband. It's just slightly felted, but that cross your heart lifts and separates. Do you all remember the bra commercials from back in the day? Some of you are my age. You have told me you're my age. Your mothers are the age of my mother. Some of you are a little older than me, some are a little younger, but many of you will remember that commercial. Uh, the reason that that commercial was so popular and all of those uh, Diane von Furstenberg dresses is because that is so flattering on so many body shapes. picture of me in this sweater so I'll post it here. Knitting pure and simple patterns used to knock it out of the park. They're just so well done. So this is written for small, medium, large, 1x and 2x. It goes from a 33 bust to a 47 bust. It um, uses light worsted or heavy DK weight yarn. Uh, the gauge again is 18 stitches. I highly recommend this pattern. If you're looking for some easy knitting, knit across pearl back with some increases because it's worked top down. And so you're just increasing along those edges. So not hard to keep track of at all. Highly recommend. The pattern is $7, available on Ravelry. I don't know if 
Um, the Knitting Pure and Simple patterns are still available in yarn stores, um, like if people can buy them printed out or not. Um, I think we've all really gone to kind of online PDFs. <laughs> so, but yeah, just a, it's a great sweater. I would like another one of these. I really would. It was fun to knit, it was interesting. You have that little hole over there that you just reach for, it's right there, you pull that through and you feel, it feels kind of like magic. <laughs> I just, yeah, this is kind of a special sweater. Let's go out and look at the IROC Knitters hashtag, should we? I don't know where we left off last time and I was gonna mark it, but I think that Patty Knits 2 is knitting a gorgeous, gorgeous shawl. Look at how pretty that is. Pinks, oh, just so pretty. And she's also got a little kid's sweater on the needles. Then Limestone Knits has uh, cast on uh, some new socks, I believe, for Sock Week 2020. And, um, and then she, look at how far she got from one picture to the next. Woot! <laughs> That's kind of a fast way to knit a pair of socks, right? Here's where I was last week and here's where I am this week. And then she's doing some No Pearl Monkeys, which I knit that pattern back in the day, but I kind of forgot about No Pearl Monkey Socks. So the monkey socks were a pattern in a book by Cookie A. And Cookie A used to be huge in the knitting world and, and especially for sock designs. And then Randy B posted, um, she often posts in the IROC Knitters hashtag, uh, talking about being a weird knitter and that she doesn't have a stash and she would just usually buy yarn per project. And then she asks if anybody else has uh, some weird things that they have about knitting. And um, so that was kind of a fun uh, thread to follow along. On. We have more than 100 posts in the IROC Knitters hashtag thread. So go over and take a look at those. Click the little follow button at the top and follow along and cheer on your fellow viewers, people that are in this family and community by just liking the posts that they like. I know a lot of people when they first get on Instagram, they're like, I don't know who to follow. I don't really know how this works. I don't know how would I know if I should follow someone. And I think that's the easiest way is to look at some hashtags and then like things that you seem to enjoy. So I rock knitters, I, I follow a lot of designers, a lot of designers. So that's another thing you can do. You can go to my thread and look at the people I follow and just read down and see if there are any names there that you recognize um, as being designers and then you could follow them through that as well. So that's kind of a fun way to do, to do that. Some, I have a special note here. The Yarn Harlot, who is doing that little sock school over on Patreon, so you can pay per month and you can follow along with her socks, um, wrote a little post, um, and since I'm following her, I got a copy of it. And there were two paragraphs in there that I just found fascinating, and I thought, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this with everybody. Nowadays, there's a real shift in the students knitting teachers see. Most of you have learned experientially. You choose a pattern you thought would be a good start, researched the skills you needed, and made the thing. At the end of it, if you chose another pattern you thought you could handle and moved along, adding skills as you needed them. Still works and my goodness has produced some mighty fine knitters, but also has produced a bunch of knitters who at least in one area or another are missing skills they don't even know they don't have. I'm thinking here of the self-taught knitters I see in lace classes. Perfectly capable of knitting complex lace, even lace where every row is an active row, but mystically still struggle with things like counting rows easily in their work, or reading their knitting, or they do things the way they learned on the internet, struggling with certain aspects of knitting, but not knowing that there's a better way or a different way more suited to their method or preferences. In medicine, professionals come up with the way they'll do things based on results. For example, imagine a heart valve repair. They don't look at all that important they don't look at all the different ways that the repair can be made. They look for the patients with the best outcomes, the lowest rates of morbidity and mortality. When, <clears throat> when finding that group of people, they go find out how their surgery was done, and then they know there's a best practice. It takes a lot of debate out of it, as well as ego. Nobody has to defend or promote the way they do things. The results speak for themselves. 
That's what we're looking at in this series, best practices for knitters. I've looked at the knitters getting the lowest rate of morbidity, unexpectedly complications in their knitting or mortality projects that really don't work out at all. And we're going to look at the way they do things. I'm basing it all on a three hour lecture class I call, give called Knit Smart. It's one of the most useful things I do, but I've always wished there was room or time to make it a weekend workshop. That's what she's gonna do. She's gonna fill in the gaps for people. And I have all kinds of gaps. I'm fully aware of the gaps, but I think that's because I take classes often and I go to knitting events and knitting retreats. And so I'm kind of immersed in it. And then I realize that I've got some gaps in my knowledge. I just love that. I didn't do a good job of reading it. <laughs> but uh, you can go over to Patreon and uh, kind of join her group by paying five, $6 a month. And then once a week, she puts up the sock stuff. So she did socks first because that's really her forte. Teaching you how to do socks without having to think too hard. She's really good at that. And I watched most of those. I think I have one left. And they were quite good. But now she's doing this Knit Smart. And I know, I think when we were up north, I noticed that she posted a thing of, this is my stash room or the yarn closet. And people were asking if she would post it. And she's like, we don't, you, nobody needs to see that. We don't need to see that. But people must have harassed her enough that she decided, okay, I'll show you my yarn closet. So I think that will be fun too. I just wanted to pass that along because I think during this quarantine, people are coming up with some really interesting ways to make you know, teaching and workshops and knitting guilds and lessons work better for people. So that's what she's gonna do. And I think knitting best practices sounds great from the Yarn Harlot because why wouldn't you wanna learn from somebody who is funny and intelligent all at the same time? Okay, I have a favor. I'm going to post in the next day a post on Instagram that's going to say, tag your favorite yarn store, local yarn store, nearest yarn store, and tell them to send me their Ravelry ID so that I can gift them a copy of my new ebook. So <clears throat> since Ravelry had their kerfuffle and a lot of people have left in the last year and a half, it's harder to market and to get word out, especially when you can't teach and you can't take a trunk show on the road and you can't show people in person what you've been working on. So one of the ways in which I'm going to try to market and do some publicity is by giving away my ebook to a yarn store. So one, they can display it. Two, they can uh, put an uh, Instagram story together on um you know, in their stories or as a post for me to get the word out that they have the book and people could come in and look at it and kind of see some of it. They can also knit some of the projects and display them in the store. And I've offered to give away a copy to any of the yarn stores that would prefer it um, to give away a copy to a customer. Um, it is National Yarn Store Day on September 12th and it was postponed <clears throat> from the spring because of COVID and so a lot of yarn stores are kind of trying to do get people in the sh in the store right calling in to order things whatever something to keep them in business we just had another yarn store in the Twin Cities announce that they're closing the unwind yarn in Burnsville I'm so sad about that I really liked Barb I had taught for Barb and you know she just can't make a go of it so uh, I'm that's what I'm offering so if you are on Instagram, go out and tag your yarn store in that post. So you would just put at Stephen B, send Corey your Ravelry ID for a free ebook. And then they'll see it. And then if they want to, they can send me their Ravelry ID via Instagram. And they'll say, our Ravelry ID is Stephen Berg or whatever. And then I can just gift it through Ravelry, the, the ebook. Um, if you're not on Instagram, you can tell them, send them an email, phone call, whatever, and say, hey, I watch a podcast who's giving away a free ebook, and you might want to get it for free, so go to Ravelry and send her your Ravelry ID, or contact her via email, Corey at irocknits.com, whatever you can do to help me give the pattern away so that more people see the book 
in local areas. Yeah, and it's all digital, so I, it, can, it can be done anywhere, anywhere. Then I also need you all to buy the book <laughs> or gift it to a friend, whatever. Once you see all the designs uh, um, in the next po podcast, I think everyone, I, I've been telling people, everyone will look at it and say, oh yeah, I would knit that. There's at least one or two or three items in the book that people would say, I'm gonna knit that. And then there are three or four items where people would say, that's over the top, that's, you know, that's wild and crazy, definitely Corey, <laughs> and I wouldn't knit those. But I will knit enough of it, or I also want to have the extras that come in the book, as well as the stories that I wrote. And hopefully they make you laugh. Because <laughs> that's always my goal, right? To keep us all smiling and, and moving forward. Okay, I have a little Corey stories for you today before we kind of wrap it up. I'm taking line dancing lessons. I started last December. I go on Friday mornings to a beginner class where we dance to all different kinds of music. Irish jig, popular, country, uh, rock and roll. We're, this week we were dancing to Gloria and we were all getting into it and messing up the steps because you want to sing along <laughs> so much. However, I'm a, a lyric listener. Like I like to hear the lyrics of the songs. And so there's a song that we dance to that I really like. And in the song, it says, moonlit concrete sheets. And I didn't know what that meant. And we've I now I've danced to it, let's say, three weeks in a row. And I'm like, I don't know what that means. And it has a good, you know, little beat to it. And um, I, it is a fun song. It's by Theo X. So not someone who's super popular. But um, there's a video online on YouTube. And so I went out and I watched the video. And the video is just, it's a boy in his room. And he wants to ask someone to dance at the dance and he's worried and then he puts on this suit and it's it's kind of a white suit and it's too big for him and he goes to the dance and he's all the kids are standing around and they're like maybe junior high age it's that whole awkward time and i don't want to give away what happens but it's just it's really a special music video with this song but i still couldn't I still don't from the lyrics I couldn't get the context of what moonlit concrete sheets would mean and I'm thinking you know if you're inviting someone into your sheets so I, I'm thinking you know might be a little naughty or whatever but I call I text my daughter and I'm like hey have you ever heard this song she's like no because sometimes you know you're singing along to song and you're singing and mostly my daughter will say mom that's not how it goes and she's like no I've never heard of it mom and I'm like okay so uh, underneath the YouTube video for this song I typed in can someone tell me what moonlit concrete sheets means should I know sorry something like that and the man who wrote the music and sings the song and he's like a DJ in the in the video gets back to me and he says well, it's actually Moonlit Concrete Streets. <laughs> so now every time we do that song in class, and I've started going on Wednesday nights to a bigger group of people, we dance um, from seven to nine, and the, the dance, or from, yeah, seven to nine, and the dances get harder and harder and harder. So you start, the beginners start off, and then those people will trickle away after an hour, and the intermediates will come in. And so we're all calling it Concrete Sheets now. The whole, we all, and the song sounds like it says Concrete Sheets, but it's not. It's Concrete Streets. <laughs> so I just thought it was funny because I literally went down that rabbit hole. And then I got back to it and I said, I sincerely apologize that I'm singing the absolute wrong words. But then I went back to class and it still sounds like sheets. So I can, and then everyone else agrees with me. They say it still sounds like sheets. Okay. So the song is called You Don't Want to Dance. And that's kind of why I thought it was You Don't Want to Dance in My Sheets. But, you know, because. 
course that's how it would be. But here, here's the song on YouTube. And it's a little boy, young guy, in his room. And it starts out really slow. You've got to watch 30 or 40 seconds before the music actually even clicks in. But they're setting the scene of this kid thinking about, thinking about, thinking about going to the dance and asking someone to dance. So if you have time, <laughs> go take a look. I would love to play it for you at the end of the video, but I really can't because, you know, copyright. And so I just wanted to, to kind of share my little bit of crazy with all of you. I do want to say that there is a chat thread on Ravelry that has been started by some women who have recently or in the past lost spouses. And if that is a group that interests you or you would just like to go over and give those people some support. Some support. It says chat at the beginning of it. And it says join in. And so you can just go into that. Anyone at all who is maybe feeling lonely or down or would like to support or be supported by other people is welcome to go into that group and become friends and supporters of one another. I read all the comments that are being made um, there last night and I I loved some of them and I'm trying to kind of stay not as like a moderator of that group, um, but I will just kind of jump in from time to time. That is going over on the Ravelry thread if, if anybody is interested in, in kind of joining or being a part of that conversation. Let's do the hellos as we end today. Which is kind of weird that I always do them at the end, but I figure we have so many that not everybody probably wants to listen to all the names. 229 comments this week for mom and I to read and respond to. You kept us so busy, but it was so nice. And I appreciate every single one. I'm still responding to every single comment that I get. So Lisa Cantrell and Gwen Gaither, Julie Smith, Pat Howes, Bonnie Glass, Wonder Willie 100, which is a great name, Wonder Willie, Robin Gasser, Mary B, Wanda Miglas, Glenda Bathgate, Penny Gilbert, who said Cornwall is absolutely everything I think it is. Although she says it gets a little busy in the summertime with tourists and it's, it's a little more quaint and easier or nicer to live there in the winter. So thank you for that, Penny. Patty Skagg, Zoe Leesk, Lori Marchbanks, Better in Popcorn, Kelly Mathern, Sandra Boyle, Olivia Menke, and Taylor in South Dakota. Jane knew exactly where I was talking about when I was telling about the stretch and sew being over near the Kmart on Minnesota and 41st Street. And Emily Doyen and Kristen Peterson and Mama Gott, Rachel Weisenstein. And Rachel, I'm thinking of you. She lost her dad just not too long ago here. Um, MC Radner, Mary from Victoria, Kansas. Diane O'Brien, Lisa Blues, Lost Mittens. Wendy Morris, Linda Lepic, Lisa Smith, Butterfly Crochet and Knit, who is Samantha, who is a 20 year old um, who knits and crochets. Mike Cotcamp wrote, Mike, I need to know if you're a guy watching my podcast, because I don't think I have too many of those. And if you're not, then I need to know who this is. Uh, Rose Lemke, Denise Norber, Natasha Heslop, RSB Design, One Cat, Diana Barnes, Luana Hendricks, Donna Walters, Carol Morrison, Judith Muscroft, Catriona Alsop, HBWT40, Allie Belzer, Pat Wagner, Nancy Willick, Susie Fab, Carol Forrester, Maggie Two Sticks, Mary Woods, Down River Knitter, Colleen AMPS, who is from Sioux Falls and also had a lot of memories uh, from places that I talked about with my mom. Lisa Nakayo, Kat Montgomery, Kathy Evans, Janet Robertson, Heather Wilson, Barbara Hajdu, Holy Hummer, Angela Jenkins, another huge thank you to Angela and Sarah for bailing me out on test knitting. And a couple of you volunteered to be test knitters for me and I really appreciate that because I need more test knitters <laughs> and more sizes and not excellent test knitters, test knitters who read every word of every pattern. <laughs> Melinda Zaccardi Rousseau, Sharon of Knit Style, MVA 5493, Sharon Noonan, S.E. Wilhight, Jesse's Mom 12, Christine Carr, Eleanor Lowry, Pamela Hopkins, Bonnie Vandemark, hi Bonnie, 
Je Janet, oh, Janet, I have you on here twice. Janet, I think sometimes you make several comments because you comment as you think of it. You can go back and just edit your first one if you want. Doesn't bother me, but I think this has happened before. Peggy Bork, Terry Monk, Beth Arner, Tessner extraordinaire, Sarah Clough Nelson, Colette Freeman, Melanie Cah Cahoon, Carol Childers, Tamara Addison, Tina Kircher, Candy Harris, Kathy B, Jennifer Walton, Kat Gore, Caroline Sherry, Donna Bauman, Mary Case, Ann Otluski, Lisa Kingston, Coleman, Carol Lynn, Sarah Benson, Amy Mickelson, Carol Rabich, uh, or Rabich, Karen Mezzacapo, Stephanie Haberman, Wendy Herman, Polly Nitz, hi Polly, Michelle M, Connie S, Brandy Stoker, Jenny Davis, Edina Cole, Emma Butcher, Danielle Brown, Chris Osborne, Nancy Johnson, Cheryl Lacemaker, Anissa M. And on Ravelry, Palin Nitz, who is Peggy, So Run It, who is Suzanne, who lifts me up all the time by writing me little notes. Peachy6560, who is Peg, and CM Jans, who is Carolyn. So, hello to all of you. Thank you for your kind and wonderful comments. It is the thing that keeps me going to do another year of podcasting because I can interact with people while being on lockdown. Episode 53 in the books, going on to episode 50, 54 next to be put up after my hand surgery. Thank you all for your well wishes on that as well. Um, I am a little nervous. They're removing a bone from my hand. It just doesn't sound like a whole lot of fun. <laughs> And they're not putting one back in. Like they're not giving me a new bone. I'm just getting some wire. So, but my knees have been great and I am so thankful that it can be fixed, right? This could be a hand thing that couldn't be fixed. So for that, I am so thankful and I will put up with not being able to knit for a while and doing some other things around my house that I've been setting out to have as projects. Okay, let's all remember that in hard times, everyone needs lifting up. Keep it colorful, keep your fork. See you in a couple weeks. And I won't be waving with this hand. I'll be waving with this hand. Bye.